All right, I'd like to welcome everybody today. I'm Sharice Magoon and I work in the Department of Lifelong Learning here at the UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing. I'm gonna be moderating the session today. Uh, you were sent an email this morning from Cynthia Gutierrez and in that email at the bottom, it explained how to complete the evaluation and to get your CE certificate. So if you have any questions regarding that, Cindy's gonna type her email in the chat box and you can reach out to her afterwards um, if you're having any issues with that. This symposium is sponsored by Texas Health and Human Services Commission in partnership with UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing. Texas recognizes June as Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome Awareness Month. You can learn more by reading House Bill 405. Um, we ask that you please keep your camera and microphones off during the presentation. And if you'll hold your questions until the end, um, if you think of a question and you wanna type it in the chat, um, please do so and then I'll read it at the end or at the end if you want to unmic uh, yourself and ask directly we do welcome that as well. We are recording this session um, for CE later which we'll have up in a couple of weeks. The presenter today is Marco Casada. He is with Texas Department of Family and Protective Services Investigations and is currently the Division Administrator for Child Protective Investigations and manages the behavioral health team for investigations. Marco has over 15 years of experience with the DFPS and served as the substance use program specialist for over nine years before, coming, before becoming the division administrator managing those positions. Marco provides training to field staff, stakeholders, attorneys, and judges throughout the state and is frequently called on to provide expert testimony related to drug tests within child welfare. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Marco. Well, thank you, ma'am. Um, so as it was mentioned, my name is Marco Quesada. Um, the presentation today is, is obviously called Drug Testing Within Child Welfare. And so what I'm going to be focusing on are the drug testing tools that uh, the Department of Family and Protective Services uses or has at their disposal uh, during the course of either an investigation or a family-based or a conservatorship case. There are also, uh, clearly there's also numerous other tools um, that we just do not use uh, or other agencies perhaps use um, instead of us. You know, the, the, the most obvious example would be like uh, umbilical cord testing or meconium testing. And we can talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation, but I just wanted everyone to know kind of from, from the beginning that this is focused on the drug testing tools that, that our agency specifically has access to. So the topics that we're gonna cover um, in this presentation is one, uh, an overview of why an individual would be drug tested in the first place. Uh, then we'll go into reviewing the drug testing types used within our child welfare system. And then we'll kind of end the conversation with a discussion about the limitations of said testing. So the first question and, and you know, I guess statement I'll say out there is, you know, question that I get fairly frequently is, why test? Why even test in the first place? Uh, there's this uh, conception, I guess, from, from people, uh, and understandably so, that, you know, uh, testing is just capturing uh, negative behavior. And so we're just, it, it becomes very punitive in nature and uh, not uplifting in, in certain ways or, or, you know, not positive outcomes. I will tell you that uh, the reason why we test as an agency has nothing to do um, with seeking punitive results. Although, you know, to be to to be transparent, certainly sometimes negative actions come as a result of of you know drug testing results. But the reason why we drug test, you know, is because we're trying to identify you know, what the substance that's being misused is uh, so that we can connect that family to the appropriate type of treatment intervention. And we're trying to also differentiate be and confirm that there is actually a substance use issue. You know, keep in mind that 
we get reports from numerous individuals at any given time from across the state. So while we do certainly receive reports of abuse and neglect related to a positive drug screen that's done at a hospital, that's only a fraction of the type of drug tests that, that are reported to us. We may also get reports of possible drug exposure from law enforcement if they've, you know, uh, had a traffic stop and, you know, they uh, discover some substances on one of the parents um, and they know that the parent has a child or there's a child in the back seat. We may get a report because of that. We may get a report because of a concerned neighbor. We may get a report because of a concerned family member. So not every reporter knows exactly what the substance is that the person is using. Some, some reporters simply say, I saw this person. They look to be under the influence. They're being erratic. Uh, their judgment seems to be severely altered. You know, or they'll, they'll describe what they believe to be substance use in their own words. And so one of the reasons why we have to drug test is to confirm that allegation that substance use is in fact the issue. You know, we, we know that sometimes, you know, a, a mental health behavior, for example, may look very similar to substance use. And so one of the reasons why we might drug test is simply to, to confirm that substance use is actually, you know, the thing that we're needing to address. And then, like I say, the other reason, uh, the other main reason is, uh, at least on the investigation side of things, is to understand uh, what the substance is that we're trying to address so that we can connect that individual with the appropriate intervention. You know, uh, a positive for marijuana, for example, is going to have a far different intervention than a positive for opiates or stimulants like cocaine or methamphetamine. And so uh, we need to make sure that we understand what the issue is so that we can make an appropriate referral so that it's documented you know, clearly and you know, we connect that individual to the correct resource and address those issues accordingly. Uh, once that case transfers to family-based safety services uh, or conservatorship as the case may be, uh, they will oftentimes use drug testing throughout the course of their case from a monitoring perspective. So they'll do, you know, somewhat frequent drug testing. They'll obviously they'll still be random, but they'll do it with some certain level of consistency of once a month, twice a month, weekly, whatever it might be. Uh, and those drug tests are, are kind of essentially to, to monitor uh, you know, continued sobriety throughout some specified period of time. Uh, so, so those are the reasons why drug testing, it's, it's, again, it's not, just wanted to clear the air, it's not simply a, a, another way to penalize a family. So with that out of the way, now we can kind of get into the drug testing types that are available to uh, our staff members um, when they're, you know, making assessments in their day-to-day -day work. We'll, we'll discuss instant oral swabs, we'll discuss lab-confirmed oral swabs, then we'll move over to urinalysis drug testing, hair strand testing, and then we'll, we'll end with nail testing. And then not part of our contracts or not any kind of drug testing that we do, but I will kind of touch a little bit on what we see um, as it relates to, you know, meconium or, or, or uh, cord blood. So starting with, with instant oral swabs, as the name implies, it is an, an instant result. Uh, the tool that's on the picture on the screen is, is pretty consistent with what these swabs look like. There are some variations depending on the manufacturer. So there's some that are the end that the, that's being held um, is slightly wider. There's some that look exactly like that one. Uh, you know, the look of it is, is ultimately uh, irrelevant. They all work essentially the same way. Uh, and that is you, the, the uh, client will put the swab in their mouth, hold it against their cheek, 
for anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds, depending on, you know, how dry their mouth is. There's a sponge attached to the end of that instant oral swab. That sponge uh, will collect saliva. Once that sponge gets saturated, uh, there's a cap that's, that's put on it and that cap kind of squeezes that, that sponge and it forces those fluids up into a chamber where the uh, instant drug panel is actually located. And so then you will see a series of lines. And so uh, no lines would indicate a negative. Uh, one line would indicate an invalid sample. Normally, you know, there's some variations on the drug test, so you would have to check with the manufacturer. Um, but typically, uh, you know, one line is, is kind of a, a, a failed, uh, you know, something something wrong with the actual device. And then two matching lines uh, indicates a, a positive on most, on most tests. Again, there's some variations to that. They are presumptive, so they're not lab confirmed in any way. Um, so these are, these are presumptive positives. They're not admissible in court. Uh, and they have some limited uh, usefulness for us as an agency. Uh, one of the great things that they're used for in our line of work is uh, because we're a child welfare agency and we're addressing allegations of abuse or neglect 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're oftentimes called on after hours. We're oftentimes called on, you know, uh, on the weekends. Um, and so we're able to use this tool uh, during periods of time when a laboratory might not be open or where there might be a great distance for that, uh, for that parent or that caregiver to, to go to a lab. Uh, and so having an instant oral swab helps us make an initial kind of preliminary assessment. And so a lot of times we're able to deploy that tool uh, and then have kind of an honest conversation with that individual. You know, we're able to see that it screens positive for amphetamines or methamphetamines, and we're able to have a conversation with that individual about uh, these presumed positive findings. And, and we find that a lot of times the individual will say, you know, uh, you know, I did in fact use, you know, and, and we were able to have a conversation about it and come up with a kind of an immediate plan to address the immediate safety of the child. Now, that's not a long-term plan. That's not something, uh, you know, that's not something that uh, has any teeth to it per se. That's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not court ordered. It's, you know, it's not anything like that, but it helps us come up with something. So if it's two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night uh, and, and there's some allegation that, that somebody appeared impaired and they were overheard, you know, screaming at an infant and, you know, that, you know, the suspected domestic violence and occurring in this home and we respond immediately and, and we're addressing the multitude of issues kind of in that scenario and, and we ask the individual to submit to a to a uh, instant oral swab and they agree to submit you know obviously that's voluntary but if they agree to submit and that they're in fact positive then that just helps us justify a need to kind of take some immediate action. And that immediate action varies greatly on a case-to-case -case basis based on, you know, a multitude of factors. You know, what kind of support system that family has, you know, how far away they are from their support system, those type of things. But in that type of scenario, it might be something where, you know, we have a relative, you know, come in in the middle of the night and, you know, provide some sort of supervision or something for those kids until we can address it, you know, first thing Monday morning. Or we might ask, you know, that individual to remove themselves from the environment, assuming that there's another safe and, and sober individual available to remain with the children. And again, I, you know, those every, there's a lot of nuance to these things. So I, I don't want to, certainly don't want to make blanket statements, but I'm just trying to give you an overview of kind of in very broad strokes, how, how we would address that. The other thing that's important to know about 
oral swabs in general, versus, regardless of whether it's the instant or as we'll discuss momentarily, the lab confirmed oral swabs is that they are they have limited panels of detection. So in the case of our oral swabs that we have a contract for, they capture uh, six drugs. And those six drugs are uh, THC, marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamines, methamphetamines, and non-synthetic opiates. So morphine-based type opioids or codeine-based opioids. Uh, and that's what it's limited to. So any other substance that an individual might be using is not going to be captured on that instant oil swab. It's not going to capture alcohol, for example, because alcohol is not one of the panels. It's not going to capture benzodiazepines because, again, benzodiazepines is not one of the panels. So we have to use oral swabs in a targeted way. Um, we certainly don't want to use an oral swab uh, if, the, if we know the individual to be using a substance that that oral swab doesn't even capture. So if we, for example, if we know the allegation is that we have a parent who is uh, misusing or abusing or has got an illicit source of, of getting Xanax, um, then, you know, that's a benzodiazepine. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't use an oral swab as a, as a confirmation for the allegation of Xanax because it's, that's not something that's going to capture. And then the last thing that's really important to know about uh, oral swabs, and again, this, this is for both instant and lab confirmed oral swabs, is that they have a very, very limited window of detection. And that is 24 to 36 hours, meaning that it will only detect a substance for about 24 to 36 hours. So that's a day to a day and a half. So we would only use that tool in situations where the allegation is that this individual was very recently using a substance that impaired their ability to parent safely. We would not be using an oral swab if the allegation was that, you know, someone believed that this caregiver was misusing a substance that impaired their ability to parent safely four or five days ago. That again, that, that would not be the testing instrument that would be appropriate for that scenario. We would never catch use from four or five days ago on an oral swab. It would be limited to the last day to day and a half. So again, some important caveats that we, we train our staff to be aware of, uh, but I want everybody on the call to be aware of as well. Lab confirmed oral swabs uh, are other than the lab confirmed piece of it, exactly the same as the instant oral swab, meaning it's the same six substances that it, it's gonna capture. It's the same 24 to 36 hour kind of detection period window. So largely they are the same tool. The, the, the clear and obvious difference is that as the name implies, a lab confirmed oral swab means that it that it goes through secondary confirmatory testing. Uh, so if we do an oral swab in the field, the caseworker is not going to receive an instant result. They're not even going to re receive a preliminary instant result result. They will simply collect that sample, close close the lid on the, on the sponge and seal it in a sealed envelope. There's generally there's a a form that both the administrator of the test and the donor of the sample sign uh, kind of initiating the chain of custody that all goes into a sealed envelope and it gets sent off uh, FedEx and then you know the lab opens it up and, and they begin the testing process and so all of that is done in-house at a lab and so the only way that a caseworker finds out the results of that type of test is via a uh, a website where uh, you have to have, you know, login access and it's, you know, confidential and, you know, it's a two-step security process and all of the, that type of stuff. Uh, every additional test that we're going to talk about today from 
from this point on will be a lab confirmed test. So all of these remainder of these tests are going to be lab confirmed, which means that they go through secondary test uh, confirmation, confirmation testing. In, in our case, uh, that is uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, or, or GCMS, or GCMSMS, which is gas chromatography, dual mass spectrometry. So everything that, uh, that we have a contract for goes through one of those types of confirmatory uh, methods. Those are, those are highly accurate methods. Uh, there's a control um, and, and they're reviewed by a medical review officer who then signs off on any lab confirmed positive finding. Uh, because they're a lab confirmed test, they do meet the evidentiary requirements of, to be admissible in court, which means that uh, if any legal action does need to be sought, we are able to take uh, the findings of any of these tests that we're going to discuss coming up and use those to support in evidence to support our need to take whatever action we're seeking in the court. Doesn't mean that the court is going to grant us that relief, but we're able to at least use those results uh, as supporting evidence as we're seeking you know, some type of relief. That relief might be that we're seeking court order participation uh, of the parent. That might be that we, the situation is so serious that we feel the need to uh, seek temporary legal custody. Uh, but re regardless of what, what aid it is that we're seeking, uh, we would need, you know, if it's related to substance use, uh, we would need something that is lab confirmed. Uh, I've already kind of discussed this uh, limited window of detection, 24 to 36 hours. They test the exact same drugs and the results are not immediate as I, as I mentioned previously. So the ways that we normally use a lab confirmed oral swab is, at least for our agency, generally it is used predominantly, I would say in more rural areas where there might be great distances for a parent or caregiver to travel to get to a uh, collection site to do, you know, your analysis or hair strand testing or nail testing or whatever, uh, or maybe that that individual lacks transportation, or maybe that individual um, has no showed uh, on multiple occasions uh, for at a collection site for a different type of drug test. So maybe they've initially agreed to go do a urinalysis test um, once or twice, but then the day that that request is supposed to have been completed, they no-show when we reach out to see why they no-showed, uh, they report they didn't have transportation or they got called in to work early or they had to work late or whatever. And so we're sometimes we're able to use a lab confirmed oral swab as a way to eliminate that, that perceived barrier, whether it's a distance barrier, whether it's a reliable transportation issue barrier, uh, or whether it's, you know, uh, this kind of continued report of, you know, life circumstances that prevents them from going to the site. So that's generally uh, how lab confirmed oral swab tests are often used, not always, but often used, but because they do have a limited window of detection, I would say they're not, they're not used uh, for ongoing monitoring of, you know, absence of substance use because you're only really seeing 24 to 36 hours. Your analysis, on the other hand, um, does have a much broader uh, window of detection uh, none of our staff collect urine. That is something that's completely done at a collection site. So if we're requiring uh, a caregiver to submit to a urinalysis sample, that means for us that we're sending that individual to a site that does actual uh, collection by, you know, a, a certified technician 
who will collect that sample, seal it, put it in an evidence envelope and send it to a laboratory for confirmation and, and, and all of the things that go along with that. Uh, the caregiver doesn't have to pay for that. Uh, and to be clear that the, all of these tests don't cost the donor anything. So in any test that I'm talking about, that's, that's a cost obviously that, that our agency pays for. Uh, and so uh, if we're sending someone to a lab, they don't have to worry about, you know, arranging for payment or anything like that. That's something that we arrange on our end. Um, we have contracts with a couple of hundred labs across the state or a couple of hundred collection sites, excuse me, across the state. And, uh, you know, payment is done kind of behind the scenes on, on that end. Uh, the good thing about a urinalysis test is that it's a, it's a far more expansive panel drug test. It's a 12 panel drug test. So it captures the same six panels um, that, a, that a swab would capture. It captures marijuana, PCP, amphetamines, methamphetamines, opiates, and uh, cocaine. But in addition to those six panels, it, al it also has a benzodiazepine panel. So it's able to capture uh, benzodiazepine misuse, um, which the other tools are not. It has an expanded opiate panel. So it has the ability to capture synthetic opioids. It, you know, it has the ability to capture oxycodone, oxycontin, uh, those type of, you know, those type of drugs that, that would not show up um, on non-synthetic opioid testing. It has a, a standalone rohypnol panel, uh, which is, you know, roofies. It's not typically something that's not your traditional drug of, of abuse per se, but you know, it, it does have the ability to test for that. Uh, it has a standalone, um, you know, uh, methadone panel. Uh, again, with methadone, uh, the issue isn't necessarily if somebody using methadone. Uh, you know, if, if somebody tests positive for methadone, then then the worker would be instructed to verify that the patient is you know, in fact, uh, you know, a patient, if, verify the caregiver is in fact a patient of a, you know, uh, MAT facility and, and, you know, get releases signed and all that stuff to verify that. Um, but it does have that panel. Um, and so there are, there are a total of 12 panels that it can test for. So it's a, it's a much broader test and it has the ability to capture a lot more things. Um, urine, uh, has a longer window of detection. So it's a bit more of a forgiving test from the standpoint of if you, if we get an intake with an allegation that somebody was using a substance or appeared under the influence and it's been more than 36 hours, generally without a urinalysis test, we wouldn't be able to verify that because you know an oral swab would would not go back further than that so we would be very limited to those time constraints but because we have a contract for your analysis we are able to have uh some expanded time frames so again with with your analysis uh most substances will be in your system three to five days so when i say most substances i'm meaning anything other than marijuana so things like stimulants, you know, whether it's cocaine, uh, amphetamines, methamphetamines, opiates, uh, they can stay in your system up to three to five days. Uh, so there is, they're, they're forgiving in that sense of like, there's not that, it's not as urgent, um, you know, as long as you, as long as the, the donor submits to a sample within three days, instead of you know, within 24 hours. So it does, it, it, it is a little bit forgiving in that sense. Marijuana obviously uh, is metabolized in the body differently. Uh, and because of uh, marijuana or THC metabolism, uh, it can stay in, in urine for up to 45 days as, you know, it is, you know, slowly re released through, you know, uh, fat oxidation. Uh, and so uh, that 45 days, again, is variable. It could be certainly much less than that. Um, 
you know, you may have heard, you know, marijuana stays in your system for 30 days, and, and that's generally true. But we also do see uh, there's also a lot of strong evidence uh, supporting that really heavy marijuana use may stay in your system 45 or even 50 days. Um, marijuana with really high THC content, which a lot of marijuana today actually does have, is is, is really high THC content with a lot of these exotic strains that are that are being grown uh, in states where marijuana is legal. Um, that creates a, a much more potent strain of marijuana, and so those some of those strains will stay in your system longer. Um, true one-time use might only stay in your system 14 days or so. So, you know, with marijuana specifically, there's a spectrum. With all other drugs, we kind of just generally stick to the rule of thumb of, of three to five days. Uh, again, because it is a lab confirmed test, like the, you know, lab confirmed roll swab, it is also admissible in court. Um, your analysis is what we would call our, our gold standard of drug testing. Um, it's a highly reliable tool. And it's something that we can do, uh, uh, you know, to detect substance use on an, on an initial investigation, or it's a tool that is used throughout the life of, a, of an ongoing case, whether it's family-based safety services, or whether it's a, um, you know, conservatorship case as a, as a great tool to monitor, you know, sobriety. Uh, and so, so that tool is used throughout the life of a case with a great deal of frequency. Uh, it's probably our most used drug test type. The next drug test type that we have, um, that we have a contract for that we use with a with, um, fair amount of regularity um, is hair strand testing. Now hair strand testing is very different than the other drug tests that I've talked about in that it specifically is capturing historical use. So with hair strand testing, you're looking at use from three to four months ago. Um, you know, there's a little bit of variability um, based on race, ethnicity and hair color type and, you know, coarseness of the hair. And so, uh, you know, kind of anecdotally, generally speaking, uh, Caucasian hair, Hispanic hair, uh, it will capture use for about three months, hair, African-American hair uh, will, will retain substances for about four months. There's, you know, there's a couple of really good uh, evidence-based studies that, that kind of back that, you know, those numbers up uh, uh, that we use with, that we cite with some regularity when, when we're, you know, presenting these, these numbers in court. Um, but three to four months is kind of your window of detection. It is a limited test, uh, just like an oral swab, meaning it's only going to have six panels. Uh, it's going to be marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, methamphetamines, opiates, and PCP. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't have those additional panels. It doesn't capture benzos. It doesn't capture, you know, uh, methadone or you know, expanded opiates or any of that kind of stuff. So uh, it is a limited panel test. It is admissible in court, um, but it is capturing historical use. One of the things to know with hair strand testing is that it takes, you know, about 10 to 14 days for hair to kind of grow through the scalp. And so uh, as you see in the picture, when a technician collects a hair strand sample, they, they take it kind of from the crown of your head they get it as close to the scalp as possible, and then they cut that, you know, that swatch of hair. Um, the inch and a half closest to the head is what's tested. So if that individual were to have had really, really long hair, the rest of that gets discarded. It's only the inch and a half closest to the head that gets tested. Every half inch of hair equates to roughly about 30 days of hair growth. Again, with some variability with race, ethnicity and, and hair color and, and age and those things. But on broad averages, three months, you know, four months for, for African-American population. And 
that's what you're looking at. But because it takes 10 to 14 days for that hair to have even grown through the scalp, what you're looking at when you send a client to do a hair strand test is possible substance use from about 10 days ago to about 100 days ago. If you're if if it's a Caucasian client, you know, if you're talking about a 90 day window of detection, if you're working with an African-American client, then that might be from about 10 days ago to about 130 days ago, because you're, you're you know, like you're identifying substance use within about the last four months. And so those are those are some nuances that that uh, myself and my team have to ensure that our staff are continuously trained up on and made very aware of so that they're making, you know, educated and informed decisions um, related to child safety when they're using uh, hair strand testing as, as an instrument to, you know, identify, you know, continued use of a substance that may be in, impacting their ability to parent safely. And so generally, um, hair strand testing is, is presented uh, in court settings in combination with something with a much shorter window of detection. So it may be presented in combination with a urinalysis or in combination with a lab confirmed test, uh, uh, oral swab. Now there are obviously examples when a hair strand can can be provided as a standalone test, and so again, I'm not saying this as a blanket statement. This is always how we do anything, but just just in general terms, that's kind of uh, how that information is presented. Hair strands are great for capturing historical use. Uh, we. In investigations, we may have a parent submit to a hair strand test to kind of see what has been happening in the home in the preceding three to four months. For ongoing services, they may choose to do a hair strand test as a way to demonstrate that a client has maintained their sobriety for three months stretches as they get ready to close their case. Maybe maybe you know doing weekly urinalysis testing or doing very frequent oral swab testing would be inconvenient for that client so you know uh, hair strand testing might be a way to kind of alleviate having to go to the lab as frequently um, and so again it all varies um, the other thing uh, that I do want to point out as it relates to hair strand testing is that everything that I've talked about as it relates to hair strand testing is really speaking specifically about hair that's collected from the head. If we're talking about hair that's collected from some other body part, uh, that is all considered body hair, regardless of whatever body part you you want to imagine in your mind. If it didn't come from the head, then by default, that's body hair. So that could be chest hair, that could be arm hair, leg hair, underarm hair. Uh, any of those uh, would fall into the category of body hair. And body hair obviously does not grow at a rate of about a half inch a month. It has a completely different growth pattern. Um, and so generally speaking, body hair, uh, has a much, much longer window of detection. Anecdotally, we say that it has about, uh, you know, a year window of detection. So if, if chest hair, for example, were to be collected on a male donor, um, we would say that that use could have occurred any time in the previous year prior to the collection. Um, body hair grows up to a certain amount, up to a certain length. Um, you know, and that very slightly, you know, but a half inch, three quarters of an inch is on average, you know, pretty consistent with body hair length on arms, legs, chest, things like that. Uh, and then that hair just kind of hovers there. And that hair ultimately, uh, you know, falls out in 11 to 12 months uh, through friction, you know, rolling around in bed, uh, bathing yourself, 
you know, using soap and the friction, the friction of the clothing that you're wearing ultimately kind of wears that, that strand and causes it to break, um, you know, the age of the, the follicle itself will, you know, eventually kind of shed and, and new growth will start. Uh, but the point is that that's a much, much longer window of detection. And so for the most part, body hair testing for us is not really an ideal tool because it has a huge window of detection. And uh, from our perspective, we're draw, you know, if we have a concern about child safety, we're trying to draw the shortest line possible connecting the alleged use to a negative impact on child safety. And so it, it's, that's much easier to do with the shorter the window of detection. So for example, if I've got an oral swab, it's certainly much easier to articulate that your use yesterday, if you were the primary caregiver of a vulnerable child, presents a problem. That's a much clear conversation to have with a caregiver or to have with the courts or to have with family if we're, if we're you know, uh, talking to relatives and, and trying to come up with plans and whatnot. Um, if I'm able to limit uh, or, or pinpoint the use to like, we have some vulnerable children right now and this person is, is essentially using right now. They've used in the last 24 hours or they've used in the last three to four days. The, the further away we get removed from that, the, the less clean that conversation gets. So we're talking about, well, this person used three months ago, but I'm worried about child safety now. That's a little harder to convey. If we're saying, oh, you know, dad did a, a, a body hair test and they took hair from his leg. So that means that he could have used at any time in the last year. That becomes even harder to say, well, to connect that to an immediate child safety concern. So with body hair tests specifically, you know, we generally would, would need to uh, you know, connect, you know, that do that test in conjunction with something much shorter, either a lab conformed oral swab or a urinalysis test. And again, there's some exceptions to that. Uh, there are times where we're working with a, with a caregiver and, you know, they had a full head of hair when we sent them to go to the lab and then they show up at the lab and they've, you know, and the time that between our requests and the time they showed up at the lab, they've shaved their head. Um, so in, in that situation, if we have to collect body hair, um, you know, it's, it's, there's still a lot of red flags there. So, you know, so certainly, you know, uh, we, too, we do take all of that stuff into account as we're working uh, with these families. Nail testing is the last drug testing type available to us at our disposal. Um, this is a fairly frequent con contract. I would say we've had this contract for, I don't know, a year or two. Um, you know, we've been able to do it much longer than that, but we, you know, prior to our contract, we were having to do a, a case-specific purchase. And so now it's part of our contracted service array, which is nice. Um, again, just like hair strand testing, it captures historical use. Just like hair strand testing, it's limited to six panels. Just like hair strand testing, it is admissible in court. The benefit to a, a nail testing is that it's, it captures historical use in the previous six months. So again, using the logic that I presented momentarily uh, or uh, a moment ago, uh, if my options are a body hair test that can go back a year or a nail test that goes back six months, then obviously it, it, it's, preferential to do a nail test because I'm interested in in the shortest time frame possible. I'm, I'm interested in what happened most recently. I, I can't concern myself nearly as much with what happened 9, 10, 11, 12 months ago. Not to say that that as an agency we advocate for for use because obviously we don't, but it just becomes much harder to connect that to to child safety with these really, really long windows of detection. So we're always striving to shorten up that window of detection as much as possible. Uh, 
I don't have slides for these next couple of things, but the, the other drug test types that, that I would say our staff within our agency see with some frequency are one, uh, meconium testing. Meconium results, we, we get reports about a positive meconium um, on, a, on, a, on a birth. Um, literally, those reports come to our agency daily. So every day we've got staff going out to hosp birthing hospitals across the state of Texas because there's a, you know, there is a positive meconium test um, that has to be addressed. Uh, meconium starts to form at about 12 to 14 weeks of gestation. So the end of the first trimester. So assuming that it's a full term birth, it's capturing roughly you know, six months of prenatal maternal substance use. Uh, so, you know, obviously in those situations, we're going out, we're having conversations with the mother, uh, we're getting medical records, uh, we're trying to figure out alternate ways to shorten that time frame from six months to, you know, at what, you know, having a conversation with the mom, does she acknowledge, you know, you know, maternal substance use? Is she denying the use? Is she saying she used five months ago, but she's got five months of sobriety under her belt? All of, all of that, you know, we take all of that, we put it in context and, and we make child safety decisions, you know, with the family based on the totality in the, of the information. But I say that simply to say that, yes, meconium test is, you know, we're aware of the time frames and we where how far it goes back. Uh, and then most recently, or more recently, uh, we are seeing hospital systems uh, start to move over to uh, cord blood collection. Uh, and so again, those have different windows of detection. Uh, and so what we did generally do is, is work directly uh, with the hospital and you know, get medical records, get information, try to see if there was any prenatal drug testing done, urinalysis testing done, for example, um, during prenatal visits, or is the cord blood the only thing that we have access to? I believe cord blood goes back about 20 weeks, I think. Uh, I would have to go back. Uh, we don't get a lot of questions on cord blood, so I'm not as familiar with it, but it is something that we're starting to see some hospital systems use more with more, free, more and more frequency. Uh, so when caseworkers have questions about that, then obviously we do the research and, and provide them with, a, with an answer. You know, we don't, we don't guess at it. We provide an answer. We'll work with the hospital system to, to connect us with the confirmatory lab or, or look through the medical records or whatever it may be uh, and provide a kind of a, an answer based on the totality of the information being provided. So, um, you know, uh, as we're wrapping this up, to kind of uh, understand the limitations in drug testing, um, obviously all of these drug tests have an inherent limitation built into them by virtue of a window of detection. So if you're talking about oral swabs, it has an inherent limitation of a maximum of 36 hours is your window of detection. Once you move past that, it's simply not going to capture substance use, even if substance use occurred. And I would argue that on a lot of these oral swabs, it's probably closer to 24 hours than it is 36 hours. They, they are kind of hit or miss at the 24 to 36 hour, that last 12 hours. Um, uh, they are not as... Uh, accurate or they're not as reliable in terms of capturing use because there's a lot of things at play there. Uh, the, the quality of the drug itself, you know, the, the potency, the concentration, the purity, all of those things, how quickly the person metabolizes. There's a lot of things that goes into it. And so they're, they're highly accurate for about the first 24 hours. Um, that last 12 hours might be potentially hit or miss. With your analysis, you know, again, assuming we're not talking about marijuana, um, you know, your window of detection is three to five days. So 
having someone do a year analysis test eight or nine days after their alleged bout of use is, is a bit pointless. It's not going to capture that. And so to see a negative result and, and use that as proof that that individual is not using uh, would be incorrect. It's not proof that they're not using, there's proof that they didn't use in the last three to five days. So certainly understanding the limitations to the window of detection is, is hugely important. Understanding that uh, not all tests, you know, you're not doing an apples to apples comparison. You know, uh, an oral swab, hair strand, and uh, uh, nail test all capture the same six substances. Whereas uh, your analysis test captures a completely different array of substances or, or additional array of substances. It does capture the same six as those other tests, but in addition to those six, it captures an, a, an additional six substances that aren't available. Um, so, so recognizing that, you know, you may have a positive for benzodiazepines on a urinalysis test but you have a negative hair strand test. And, you, you know, we were often asked, you know, like, well, which one of these tests is wrong? Why is, why is this donor positive on this test, on this urinalysis test, but they're negative on this other test? Well, we have to remind staff is one of these, neither of these tests are wrong. I believe that the negative test is negative. I believe that the positive test is positive. The positive test happens to be positive for benzodiazepines in this example. That just happens to be a, a substance that's not detected on a hair strain test. So the negative is simply by virtue of that's not something that, that those panels are, are looking for. And so understanding those nuances uh, will help clarify kind of the limitations. The other limitations is to a certain extent, you know, they're, they're cost prohibitive. And so certainly uh, an instant oral swab that might be, I don't know, five to seven dollars uh, versus uh, a year analysis test that's probably, and I'm guessing here, but I'm, you know, probably 25 bucks versus a hair strand test that might be a hundred dollars versus a, a nail test that might be a couple of hundred dollars. You know, there, there are different costs to all of these things. Now, we don't let cost de de you know, deter us um, from using a test if we're trying to identify a, a child safety issue. So we'll never not use a hair strand test or not use a nail test if we feel that we need to do that test to uh, rule out you know, a concern with substance use just because it's expensive. Like, but, but there is, I mean, but the reality is there is, these tests are expensive. And so we certainly are, while we won't limit the use because of costs, we are also aware of like, if we can get the answer to our question with a, with a cheaper and equally reliable testing instrument, then certainly we would want to do that. We would want to use uh, your analysis test, for example, um, in lieu of uh, nail tests, because one, it has a, a shorter window of detection and it's, and it's far less expensive, assuming that the use occurred in the last three to five days. Now, if the use occurred four and a half months ago and somebody, for whatever reason, needs to confirm that use or there's a standing court order that we have to comply with and the court order requires that this individual submit to a nail test, then we'll do a nail test. Um, but again, the, the context of all of that stuff really and truly matters. Um, so again, that's a broad overview of drug testing in general. So I'm gonna put my contact information up, but I also I wanna open up the floor to, to the questions that have come in so we can try to get all these questions answered for you. Uh, we do have one question. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what if a client 
is having observed UA two a two to three times weekly for four months. All negative of substances. However, a hair strand test is showing fluctuating levels. What could this mean? And in the eyes of the agency, should the client be seen as non-compliant? That's an excellent question. And it's uh, there's a lot to, to bite off there. So I'll try to break that down into, into different, uh, different areas. Yeah, I don't think you can say based solely on a positive hair strand test that goes back three to four months. Again, I don't know the ethnicity of this individual. So it could be three months, it could be closer to four months. Um, but regardless, you're looking at historical use over that last three to four months. Uh, you have confirmation from an observed urinalysis test that's occurring, sounds like, uh, multiple times a week. Uh, so you're not really at risk of this client uh, cheating the test in some way. You know, they're not bringing in fake urine because they're, they're you know, they're being observed. There's, you know, somebody, a lab technician is literally watching them uh, submit to that sample. Uh, you know, the temperature is taken so they know that it's coming directly out of the body at an appropriate temperature within range. You know, the pH balance is checked. And so, you know, like, you know, it's not being diluted and all of those type of things. And so I think we can speak with a great deal of confidence that all those negatives are in fact truly negative. I think when you're looking at a hair strand test, you're look again, you're looking at use from from up to four months ago. Um, and if they were using four months ago, then chances are they were probably also using five months ago or six months ago or seven months ago. So it's going, it's going to take three to four months from their last date of use before they're going to be able to produce a negative hair strand test. So let's say, for example, their last date of substance use was two and a half months ago, then uh, you would, the date that you would expect the negative hair strand test, you basically, uh, you go from their sobriety date. So let's say their sobriety date was May 1. That's the last time they used the substance. So if they're Caucasian or they're Hispanic, then you add 90 days to that. So that puts you at August 1st. And then you'd add 10 to 14 days for the hair to actually grow through the scalp. So to make the math simple, let's say August 15th. August 15th would be the first day that that client would be expected to have a negative hair strand test. Any drug testing that you do prior to August 15th. So, you know, again, today is, June 24th, um, it's still going to be positive because, because that use uh, falls within the, you know, that May 1st falls within that window of detection. And the other thing that I would add to that is, is looking at the levels going up or down or staying stagnant. Uh, it's just really misguided. You know, one of the things that I know I preach really hard and I know that my staff uh, preach really hard and we try to, to really get um, our caseworkers to understand and the stakeholders to understand whether that's CASA or attorneys or judges is that you, you can't look at a level in isolation and assign it some random value and say, 20,000 is indicative of daily use or high use or whatever, um, because you don't know, in essence, you don't know where that level was either before or after, right? That, that number would have been some other number had the test occurred a week before, had, had the test occurred a week later. And so that number could be increasing, that number could be decreasing. Uh, so that number, is relatively irrelevant. That the number for our purposes in child welfare 
ser simply serves as confirmation that it is a lab confirmed test and that um, it is a valid positive sample because not only is it positive, but they're telling you the, the exact amount of metabolites. But that's kind of where it ends with as far as the numbers. You can't use that number to, you know, further extract additional information in terms of uh, this is a lot of use, this is not not very much use, um, or this is recreational, or you know, whatever we hear. Um, that so so levels, you know, like trying to use levels in that way is a little bit uh, a, a bit incorrect. And so what I would say, I guess, in conclusion, to answer that particular question is. It sounds like you've got someone with, with some sobriety under the belt. Um, but if, if a hair strand test occurred kind of in the same window, um, it doesn't mean that they somehow relapsed because I, I think you have plenty of your analysis tests to confirm that they didn't. You either have, you have a test that's going back to when, to a period of time when they were using, or you may have a positive, um, due to, to some continued exposure that's not use. And so uh, methamphetamines, for example, is a substance because of the tox toxic nature of methamphetamines um, that it will uh, contaminate a home environment or, or a vehicle or wherever the meth was used in. And if you spend a lot of time in that environment, you're going to test positive for methamphetamines simply because of the contamination. And so that's another thing that we might need to look at. Um, so without getting too much into the weeds, um, certainly one plausible explanation might be that you have a, an individual who continues to test positive because of exposure. And so the, the concern might not be use anymore. The concern might either be that this client has continued to uh, engage or interact with others who are still actively using or manufacturing methamphetamines, or there might be a contaminated home environment that, that we need to help this family address. We need to, you know, get the family together and have them maybe have a, spend a weekend really deep cleaning the entire house and, and or replacing bedding or, you know, uh, all of those type of things. So, you know, there's a lot of information there, but I don't want to discount all those negative tests, and I don't. I don't think that the that the positive hair strand test automatically means that that we've somehow been duped, and that this individual is still using. Okay, you might have addressed this. Um, somebody is asking: Is there some sort of guide regarding what different levels on a UA mean for a client showing a level on one of one fifty two on a UA for marijuana? Is that considered high? I didn't answer it that directly, but I, I mean, I will. Um, I, again, I can only speak for myself. <laughs> so I will tell you that as a rule of thumb for, for, for me, for myself, I am not a fan of using levels. And I instruct CPS staff or CPI staff to not focus on levels. You know, my, the way we train is that we simply look at a drug test as positive or negative, either substance use occurred or didn't occur. The reason I say that is because, as I mentioned previously, a level when you're, it's, your body is not an on-off switch. So when you consume or when you ingest a substance, you don't go from zero to some arbitrary number and then hover there for three to five days or 30 days and then and then immediately go back to zero. It your your that level will rise and fall along a a very bell curve. And so, you know, if you do a line of cocaine after a period of sobriety, you're going to start at zero. Then the, as that cocaine gets metabolized and broken down in the body, it's going to go one, two, three, four, five, or whatever, you know, it's going to continue to rise. The drug test will pick it up once it gets to a minimum level of 300, because that's the minimum threshold of detection for most drug tests on a cocaine panel. So a level of 299 wouldn't even, that would be reported to us as negative, even though 
cocaine use actually occurred. And then we would see it at 300, 301, 3, whatever. And let's say it peaks at 2112, and then it starts to go back down. So I say all of that to give you some background. So I say that to say, if a level is 1723, all I can truly say is that, that that sample is positive. I don't know that 1723 is the highest that, that particular um, panel went or that, that, you know, like that could have been 1723 on its way up to a much higher level or, or on its way down from a much higher level. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, I know that the question was specifically about marijuana. So the so marijuana drug testing for the most part has had uh, the range has the minimum level of detection required is 15 nanograms. And historically, it peaks at 300 nanograms. Now, the, I have seen recently some, some testing sites that, that read marijuana levels even higher than 300. But traditionally speaking, 15 to 300 has been kind of the range. So 151 would essentially be, be right in the middle there. It would be about halfway between in the spectrum. Um, but there's a lot of ways that that client could have hit 151. They could have hit 151 by smoking marijuana regularly that, that maybe doesn't have high levels of THC. They could have also hit a level of 151 by smoking marijuana much less, but let's say smoking a really uh, high THC content cannabis. Uh, so, you know, they might be smoking some quote unquote really good weed once a week and, and or twice a week, let's say, and hit 151, or they might be smoking a lesser quality product daily. Um, so the, the, my point is you could get to 151 a variety of different ways. So, so it, there, there are no charts because of that. There are no charts because it's never going to, you're never going to be able to say A equals B in that way. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, we have another question. I've had clients complain about results when CPS tests chest hair one time, then leg hair the next time. Does this matter at all? So let me make sure I understood the question correct. Um, on one of the tests, the, the sample was collected from the chest and on the other test, it was collected from the, hip, from the leg, but both were body hair. Is that it? Did I understand you correctly? That's, that's what the question says. If you want to okay. unmic and, and, and speak more on that, uh, you can. Yeah, she said, they said yes. Okay. So, I mean, there there is, there's a couple of things to unpack here. Um, each of those tests go back basically a year from the date of collection. So I, I would say that I'm not sure why we would do a, a substance. Like to me, if we did chest hair um, and it goes back a year, I can't really do another test, body hair test, because there's just so much overlap. Uh, even if I did another test two months later, 10 months of both of those tests are going to overlap on top of each other. Um, does that make sense? So if I, if I did a test on, on April 1st, it's going to go from April 1st, 2021 to April 1st, 2022. And then, my, and then I do another body hair test, regardless of body sight, regardless of chest neck, hair, underarm, whatever, wherever you want it to be. If I did it in June 1st, it's going to go from June 1st, 2021 to June 1st, 2022. And so both of those tests are capturing use from June 1st, 2021 to April 1st, 2022. So 10 months of those panels are, are duplicative. And so I don't know how you could use two body hair tests to monitor sobriety or compliance. And, and I don't, I, I think at that point, looking at the levels again, 
metabolites may concentrate differently on different body hair sites. And so looking at levels would, would be inappropriate also. So hopefully that answers that question. You know, if it doesn't, I'm happy to answer a subsequent question. Okay, we have a different question here. Do hospitals have a legal obligation to report positive drug screens from infants that had meconium testing completed? These infants are often discharged from the hospital before providers have the results. So a positive test may be unreported. So hospitals are mandated reporters. Um, and uh, one of the, one of the, if you look at Texas Family Code, one of the um, definitions of, I think, I think currently, if you look at the definition uh, in Texas Family Code today, on, on June 24th, it would actually say drug addicted baby. We know that that's, you know, an incorrect term, and that's very insensitive and not accurate. I'm not debating any of that. But I'm just telling you that's if you were to look up Texas Family Code today, that's how it would be listed. But within that listing, um, one of the definitions is uh, a drug in in body fluids, and so so under that current Texas Family Code definition, yes, a mandated reporter would have to report a meconium positive. Now, what to answer the kind of the other part of that question? I would say that we see that all the time. Like we see infants that are born, you know, happy, healthy, full weight, all, all of those great qualities. And so understandably the hospital discharges mom and the infant two days after delivery, three days after delivery, all the time. The meconium test may not come back until 10, 12, 14 days after delivery. So mom and baby are long gone from the facility before the results come back. Um, the hospital simply reports that and then staff get assigned that case and, and they go meet with the family. So that happens all the time. There, so there isn't a burden to keep a mom or, or an infant at the hospital until meconium test results come back. Certainly no, that, that would be a ridiculous expectation. You know, when the hospital deems that the child is ready for discharge, the child is ready for discharge and, and the family's free to go. If you get a positive meconium, then it gets reported and then, and then we address it. Again, keep in mind, meconium goes back really far. It goes back about six months. And so just because we have a meconium positive does not mean we're going to take any action on that case. It may be that mom says, you know what? Um... I was smoking marijuana recreationally. I didn't find out I was pregnant until I was three and a half months pregnant. The moment I found out, I stopped using. We get medical records. It seems to back that up. She had her first prenatal appointment at three and a half months. She had negative UAs throughout her pregnancy. And so the only thing that we have is this meconium that goes back six months. We're not going to intervene in something like that. You know, we, you know, educate mom perhaps, and, and, and give her a list of resources should she feel like the need to engage with those resources in the future. But um, I also don't want anyone to think that, like, I don't want to make this call because it's going to negatively impact this, this parent's life. That, you know, every time you make a report doesn't mean that, that some negative action is going to happen. Okay, we have a question. What about clients who mentioned they tested positive for marijuana and they may mention they did not smoke, but were close to someone who was smoking? Do they, pass, do they test positive for secondhand? That's an interesting question. Um, that kind of goes into the exposure conversation. I will say, again, some of this is anecdotal. There is, there is definitely some, some evidence-based data that supports this. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, I guess in, in the 12 years that I've been doing this direct work, I can tell you from my experience what I've seen. And what I have seen is that there are essentially three drugs that someone can test positive for from exposure and not use. And in order of likelihood, I would say most likely by far is methamphetamines, simply because of the, of the, the toxic nature of methamphetamine and the fact that it 
you know, it leaves behind a sticky residue and all of that kind of stuff. And so there are times when somebody might test positive for methamphetamines, not because of use, but because of exposure. We see that with children from homes where methamphetamine is used all the time. We see a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old who tests positive for methamphetamines. Certainly that two, three, or four-year-old is not using methamphetamines. They're positive because of the use that's occurring in the home and because of the, the meth residue that's, that's kind of ingrained in the, in the surfaces of the, of the, the home. Uh, generally speaking, uh, if the meth is because of, if the positive meth is because of exposure and not use, we, you will see on the drug test that there's no correlating value on the amphetamine panel. So you might have 7,023 for methamphetamines, but on the amphetamine panel, it's blank. If it's actual use, there will be a value for the methamphetamines and a value on the amphetamine. So you might have 7,000 and you might have 1,100 of amphetamines. So that's, amph that's methamphetamines. That's, that's the most prevalent exposure one that we see. Uh, crack cocaine, similarly, you can see some of that stuff. So you might see a, a positive for cocaine due to exposure if somebody's using crack cocaine. Similar reasons, when somebody smokes crack, you know, those chemicals aerate and then, and then the toxins land on surfaces. Somebody touches those surfaces, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this question was specifically about marijuana and marijuana I would say is, is the, the third substance that somebody could test positive for exposure and not consumption. I, I tend to put an asterisk next to marijuana because uh, marijuana, you would have to have some really high levels of exposure to cause a positive. And we don't see that. We certainly don't see that um, with incidental exposure. So like if you're at a live outdoor concert and you, you smell some marijuana near you and you know somebody somewhere smoking marijuana because maybe you can't see them smoking, but you can smell it. You don't have to worry about, you, you're not going to test positive. Um, there's just entirely too much. You're in open air. There's too much ventilation. The smell alone is not going to cause a positive. However, um, if you've got individuals who are hotboxing, so meaning that you have individuals who are in a confined space with little to no ventilation, uh, you might have one individual who's actually smoking, but two or three under other individuals who are also actively getting hot. And so think of a, a car, for example, with the windows rolled up. The passenger could be the one smoking, but the driver could be getting as high or nearly as high um, from the smoke in the car that has nowhere to escape uh, or anybody in the back seat. And again, we see that with, with, with children all the time where you know parents may be using marijuana in the front seat, the infant is in the back seat in a car seat. The infant is, is not, not, they're nonverbal, so they can't speak. They can't tell, hey mom, hey dad, you know, like I'm lightheaded or you know, like, I don't, I don't feel right. So they're, they might be equally impaired and just have no way of communicating that uh, other than, you know, uh, the effects of the lethargy that you see or whatever. Um, so yes, to answer the question, it, it certainly can happen, um, but the conditions have to be right. And generally that means a, a very small confined space with no ventilation. Um, the conditions for a positive, for exposure with methamphetamines or crack cocaine are far easier to replicate accidentally. I think with marijuana, it's a bit intentional. Uh, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, we have another question. Does a lower level on a subsequent test, example 150 on a UA today and a 100 on a UA a month from now, support the claim that use has ceased? it seems logical that levels would drop over time if use has ended. No, it's, it's certainly perfectly logical. Um, I just think you have to be, so, so there's two caveats to that. If we're talking about 
drugs other than marijuana, because I think you have to put these in two separate categories. So if you're talking about drugs that are not marijuana, you're talking about opiates, stimulants, barbiturates, anything like that, benzodiazepines, those are in and out of your system three to five days. So it doesn't matter if this person was 150 a month ago and you know 100 yesterday. Those are two completely different bouts of use because that, that level wouldn't have stayed in their system for a month. Now, if you're talking about marijuana specifically, something that stays in your system 30 to 45 days, and you do a test, and then two weeks later you do a test and the levels go down, yeah, I think that the, the, the natural conclusion is that this person has discontinued use and you're starting to see the levels go down. I think th the caution here is that because marijuana is released through fat oxidation, through the burning of fat, you know, as your body, you know, uses fat for energy, that there are times that your body is oxidating fat at higher rates than other times. So that same individual may decide to go for a, you know, a low intensity jog that predominantly burns fat, you know, uh, and they may free up, you know, some fat molecules, which may in turn free up some THC molecules. And so if that individual were to go do a UA, you know, right after that, you might see something weird with that, you know, that you might see a level maybe increase a little bit, even though that person hasn't used in two or three weeks. And so I just want to be clear that, that you're not wrong, that yeah, naturally you should expect to see the levels kind of go down until they eventually reach zero but there might be some plausible explanations for for some weird small spikes i mean nothing crazy you're not going to go from 50 to 300 but you might go from 50 to 67 um because of a, a bout of light exercise that that predominantly burn fat so there's just a lot of nuances that you have to be careful with Okay, we have another question. A client said they were told by officials that they are continuing to test positive for cocaine. It has been over three months since last use. Client has not relapsed and has also been in a controlled environment. Any possible truth to this or is it more likely the client is not being told the truth? I mean, I don't have, I don't, know what benefit it would be to lie to the client about a positive. I mean, certainly if the, the client is the donor, um, they certainly are privy to their own tests. So, I mean, one thing I guess I would say is the client can certainly ask for a copy of their results um, if they're questioning whether they're being lied to or not. Uh, so if, for example, if I were the client and I submitted to a drug test, and my caseworker said, hey, you're positive. I'm entitled to see a copy of my drug test. So I, I can I can see the a copy of my drug test to, to see that it is positive. Other people aren't entitled to it. So I, they can't give my wife a copy of it. They can't give my mother a copy of it, but they can give me a copy of it because I'm the I'm the donor of that specimen. So that's that's point number one that I would make um, in, you know, in the event that that's a question. Um, and then two is, obviously, it depends on the type of drug test, right? Because there's no way that this client would still be positive on a urinalysis if their last use was three months ago. If, they're, if, they're, if the test is a urinalysis test or an oral swab test and they're still positive, they've simply figured out a way to use Regardless of a controlled environment, somebody has snuck something in, something has happened, somebody has figured out a way to use. They now, said it, yeah, they said it is a urine test. Yeah. They commented. Okay. Yeah, because it would only go back three to five days. So I, I guess I would start by, by getting a copy of the actual drug test. Other questions? Any more questions before we wrap it up? You can unmic or type it in the chat.
So excellent questions. You guys came came out strong today. Yes, I love love the questions. These are great. All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds just in case. You guys have my contact information there at the bottom. Feel free to email me if something comes up later that uh, you didn't think to ask, or you know, there's a scenario that pops up in the future, or if I say something and it maybe it didn't seem clear, but you didn't want to, you don't want to interrupt the presentation today for some reason, and and you'd rather speak to me directly to clarify that for you. I'm happy to do so. Uh, my contact information is on the slide. Yeah, and we did put the uh, PowerPoint is is in the course. It's in the Canvas course that you registered on. So if you check there and you need to reference anything or just um, you don't get a chance to write the contact information down, it's there. All right, well, we'll wrap it up. Everybody's saying thank you. Wonderful presentation, uh, good information, very informative. So uh, we do really appreciate you, Marco. As as always, um, you've you've really enlightened us and given us a lot to to go on and think about and um, to use in our, all of our all of our clinical and, and treatment settings. So thank you so much for being a part thank of the you. program. Everybody have a, have a good day. Thank you.